Hi, I'm Lee Allen II, Cleto Inc. Chief Operating Officer. Thank you for viewing another Season 2 episode of the Cleo Edge Podcast. Today, we're very honored to have Judge Phyllis D. Thompson, Senior Judge for the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, as our guest. A former partner at a major U.S. law firm, Judge Thompson has been proudly sitting on the bench for 17 years. She's always given generously of her time, volunteering in numerous ways, both in a professional and civic-minded capacity. Judge Thompson, welcome to the Cleo Edge podcast, and we're honored that you would take time out of your busy schedule to join us for what we know will be an enriching conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. After reading your background, you're somewhat an anomaly in that, aside from your master's degree experience in Princeton, your life, including birth and upbringing, bachelor's in law degree, and your professional career, has all pretty much happened within Washington, D.C., being a D.C. native and lifelong resident, can you talk a bit about your affinity for the city and why it's special for you to have accomplished and experienced so much all in one place? Well, there, there's no place like Washington, D.C. It is, of course, the center of, of power politically. Um, I think it is a vibrant city, a wonderful city to grow up in. It's one that has changed uh, during my lifetime for sure. Um, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. that used to be called Chocolate City. It was more than 70% African-American. Uh, I think we now are about 48%. So the city has changed a great deal. And I started my education in the days of segregation. So I went to all black schools in, in the city. And things are very different now. So I've seen a lot of change. I, I feel about my hometown the way I think most people feel about their hometowns. Uh, there are fond memories here. I still have a family here, so so I love it. I sometimes think it would have been good to live somewhere else, but I mm -hmm. think I would have landed back here anyway. And I think I have an appreciation for this city as as neighborhoods and communities and not just the seat of political power. Um, but it is an extraordinary place to have grown up. And one story I always tell people is that I always thought that the definition of the word museum was a free place to go and look at exhibits because, of course, we have all of the free Smithsonian museums here. And the first time I went somewhere else and learned that I had to pay to get in, I couldn't believe it. But but this is a museum. What, are you, what do you mean there's an admission fee? So it's a, it's a marvelous place to grow up. Um, uh, and as I approached my junior high school years, um, uh, my friends and I would spend our time going to all of the, the tourist sites. So uh, it can't be beat. I have a lot of fondness for this city. And um, that accounts in part for why I wanted to do public service uh, in, in this town. That's great. I can totally relate to what you're saying with the museum factor because um we, you know, I talk to other residents who've been around here for a long time, and we tend to take it for granted that, you know, we have access to all this history at any given moment, especially that thing about the paying versus non-paying, because that's applicable to our zoo. You know, any other zoo in the country, you typically have to pay to go. Exactly. Into, like, you, know, you have to pay to go in the zoo. Um, so we thought all of it was up to that. So I totally get it. And that's great. Um, with respect to your post-secondary academic pursuits, and I don't doubt that this is probably the case for you in high school as well. Uh, you were seemingly a star, or excelled at every level, you know, being elected Phi Beta Kappa and valedictorian of your graduating class at George Washington, matriculating at Princeton, earning a master's, and then returning to GW for law school, where you were a member of the Law Review and in the order of the Quaff. For all of our younger listeners out there still working their way up the academic ladder, please discuss where your drive to be a high performing student came from. Was it instilled in you growing up by family members or something more so just embedded into your DNA or perhaps like a mixture of the two? I, I, you are right that I always had a lot of drive as a student. I'm not sure where it came from. Um, my, my parents were good people, uh, but they were not what you would consider educated people. And we never, my siblings and I never got lectures about the importance of education. Um, my mother finished 11th grade. My father graduated from high school. Um, but my parents were working class people who never really had aspirations to go to college. And I don't remember them telling us that we needed to go, frankly. But I think 
they instilled in us the sense that anything that you undertook to do, you ought to try to do well. And so I took that seriously. So I worked hard as a student, and I, um, um, I, I, I mentioned before that I grew up in Washington when it was uh, predominantly black, and when I went to segregated schools. And um, unfortunately, I had instilled in me early on a sense that maybe we in our all black schools couldn't do as well as the students in the white schools. I took that as something of a challenge. And so when I finally uh, got a scholarship to go to a, a private high school, a Catholic high school in the area that was a mostly white school, it was a challenge to me to see if I could keep up. I was amazed to learn that I could keep up and I was um, intent on on rising to the top. So I was indeed the valedictorian of the high school class, the valedictorian of the college class, because I worked hard, um, meaning to do the best I could at everything I undertook. So that's always been kind of my mantra, and it's it's what motivates me um, even today. Did you go with that experience? It's interesting. Uh, do you recall maybe having to deal with the specter of um, prejudice or bias, not only from maybe, you know, ethnicity, but also as, in terms of your gender? Um. You know, I think so, but I grew up um, when uh, the women's lib movement was nascent and growing. And um, one of my favorite songs as a college student was I Am Woman by Helen Reddy. So I, I started to believe early on that there was nothing that could stand in my way in terms of gender. And I never bought into those notions. And uh, it was not a good idea for anyone to suggest otherwise to me. I think I was not quite uh, so ready and able to believe that I could overcome uh, because of my race. And uh, that, that I think, is a continual challenge. I mean, I remember getting into college, into one of the colleges I applied to, um, as the valedictorian of my high school class and being told that I would have to come to a, a summer uh, a prep program that I thought of as a remedial program. And I thought, there's only one reason they're making me do this. It's because they don't right. think I can do this work because I'm Black. And so it took a long time, frankly, to get to get over that. Um, uh, uh, but I, yeah, I when, when people ask me to identify ways in which it's been more difficult as a woman, I have a hard time doing it because I just never bought into that. And I have to say that I've had so much help from my family. I mean, one of the things that has been really difficult about building a career is trying to do it while having small children. Um, but my mother helped me so much taking care of my children. So I just feel like um, uh, th those kinds of supports are, are what make it possible to to succeed and to, to um, go through the glass ceiling if indeed it's there. Wow, that's amazing. There's nothing like a good support system to help you yes. uh, propel you to your goals and help you reach them. In, in undergrad, I read that your major was anthropology. What led you to selecting that as your bachelor's degree pursuit? And did you at the time envision having a specific type of career tied to that subject area? Um, I was interested in anthropology uh, because I was interested in understanding other cultures I'm fascinated with the idea that values are different from one culture to the next, fascinated by different languages and how much values are baked into the language. So that's what I studied. Um, and, and toward my junior and senior year, I also became really interested in my religion courses because I, I was just deeply thoughtful about what this whole human experience is about and why are we here and how do we figure out what, what's right and what's just and that kind of thing. But I'll say that I really had no idea what I was going to do with any of that. And I, okay. uh, as you noted, I, I ended up going to graduate school. I went to Princeton um, and I went to the Department of Religion where I was in a PhD program. I earned a master's degree. I, I left that program before I got my PhD. 
uh, because I went to, uh, to teach as a sabbatical replacement for someone. But I think I never uh, really saw myself as an academic. I didn't embrace that profession. And I do think it was in large part because I just didn't see anyone in it who looked like me. I, cu I couldn't figure out what to do. I, I, I tell people my mother used to say to me, over and over again. Now, tell me again, what, what is it you're going to do when you finish this degree in religion? Right. What, what did you say you were going to do? And, and what's this anthropology thing? What, what can you do with it? What job are you going to get? And, and somehow it was not so comfortable to say, well, I'm going to be an academic. I'm going to teach because I, I didn't see that as a possible career path. Um, uh, so I still had some dissatisfaction while in graduate school. And I think I was in part drawn to law school because that was a profession everyone understood. We all knew about lawyers. We saw them on TV. So um, that was what I call my sort of non-noble reason for going because I thought I could fit myself into something that, that I understood. Uh, but the other thing was that somehow or another, I became aware of, of the work of the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, mm -hmm. while I was in graduate school. And I thought, I could do work like that if I went to law school. And so that's what sent me there um, um, and, and how I found what I think was my, my um, career path, the one that was uh, suited to me. Gotcha. Were, were at any point you considering um, after obtaining your master's in religion and, and you know, you, as you alluded to, spent time as a theology instructor at Georgetown, at any point were you considering the ministry as a, in church as a career path or no, um, that I never was really... also academic? Yeah, I, I never really considered the ministry. I was very active in um, my church, which was a Roman Catholic church. And of course, uh, women uh, were not and are not priests in that church. So I, I wasn't I wasn't considering that. And I wasn't I didn't find appealing the life of a nun. So I wasn't considering the religious life. I guess I did consider teaching and I did, as you say, ultimately teach in the theology department at Georgetown. But once again, that just was not where I saw myself. And I wondered whether I could have an impact uh, in my community in the world by doing that. And I very much wanted to do that. Um, it, it's funny, people had said to me over the years that I should go to law school because I was a good student. Um, and my answer was always, oh, well, I don't know. I don't think I'm aggressive enough to be a lawyer. I'm kind of shy. I'm really not that kind of a person. I can't see myself as Perry Mason in the courtroom. I think I never realized until pretty late in the game that the work that lawyers do is so varied. There's so many opportunities to, to uh, use legal training. And when I came to understand that there were other ways to practice law, uh, that's when I decided I could do it and that I should go to law school. Got you, got you. And upon um, you know, the process of you matriculating at GW for law school, you know, we are on the Clear Edge podcast and, you know, we were established in 1968. So, we're, you know, it's going through our 56 year of operation. Had you heard about Clio prior to starting law school? Um, I had heard about Clio. Yes. And um, I was not really involved with Clio. And to be honest, I, I don't know why, but I know that several students were. Um, so, yes, I had heard of it. Um, and when I became uh, a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Conference of Bar Examiners, and we were um, looking at ways to um, to demonstrate our commitment to diversity, Clio came to mind again um, as a program that I knew about and others knew about um, that had been uh, out there working hard and getting good results for many years. So, yes. So I was pleased right, to make that connection again. Right, because one of our board members, uh, Judge Owens, I know Denise Owens is a good friend of yours, and so um, yes. she talks about her time at GW Law School as well. So, and and you talked about your journey to the profession, and you know, in the end, what drew you to the law was that you saw you were finally able to see yourself as having a career path because you didn't have to be fit in one lane because lawyers cover so much base and um, so many different angles, and the Covington and Burling. In 1989, you had the distinction of becoming the firm's very first African-American female partner. Tell us what that experience was like for you back then, and if applicable, the amount of sacrifice and work ethic it took to achieve that accolade. I imagine that 
You must have faced more than a few obstacles you had to overcome in order to succeed, including the over lack of diversity at the time, both with respect to gender and ethnicity. Yes. Well, I was very excited to become the first African-American woman partner at Covington. I, I um, hadn't thought of working for a large law firm, but I went to work at Covington as a summer associate back in the summer of 1980. And I realized what um, an array of exciting work the firm does. And also realized that um, the firm and, and other large firms like Covington present a real opportunity to be able to do some of the pro bono work that I thought was so important to do. Um, and so I thought, this is a place where I can build a career. I'll come back here and do this work. And I um, I, I tell people that the, the way I succeeded, I think, is that I just worked really hard. One story I always tell is about how I I um, flew to Hawaii. We were doing work for a Hawaii state agency uh, that had been sued. And I went with one of the partners to Hawaii and um, uh, the, the partner was telling the client in the meeting that we would need to file a lengthy brief in response uh, to the lawsuit that had been filed. And, and Phyllis here, my associate, will be writing the brief. And I think she ought to be able to get it to you by the end of the week. And I'm thinking that there's so many issues to be addressed. It, it might be 90 or 100 pages, but, but we can get it done. Phyllis can get it done. Well, Phyllis's eyes were crossing at about that time, wondering how was I going to do this. But I made up my mind I was going to do it, and it called for some sleepless nights, I have to say. I, I spent the next week. Um, maybe getting two hours of sleep and working the rest of the night every night. But I produced this brief at the end of the week. And I really think that um, that performance on my part showed my commitment to the work and my willingness to work hard. And I think it opened doors for me. I think it was my pathway to the partnership, quite frankly. So I always tell people that you just have to be willing uh, to to really go the extra mile and commit yourself because then people will ease up on you a little bit. I mean, I think after that, when I had projects with the same partner and I had something that might interfere with my getting something done as quickly as he wanted, um, he would always say, oh, that's okay. All right. So if you need another day or two, that, that'll be okay because I had always, I, I had already established myself as someone who was dependable and would, would go the extra mile and get the work done. And that's the way I think you have to approach success in a major law firm. You just have to give that commitment. And I don't, um, uh, I don't ever forget uh, the support that I had from my family while trying to do that, because goodness knows you can't make that kind of a commitment when you have other responsibilities and no one else to help. So it's a delicate balancing act, but it can certainly be done. And it is it was for me the the pathway to be able to do not only the work I liked at the firm, uh, the the paying work that I liked, but the, the pro bono work that I liked uh, to do at that at that large law firm. I I do think that it um, I mean I gravitated toward a practice area that really uh, meshed well with my my interest in public service. Um, I I. Uh, did work for state government agencies. And a lot of the time I felt like I was working for the government and doing public service in that way, even though they were, were paying clients. And, um, and, and I think that helped convince me that when the time was right, I wanted to, to apply t to be a judge. But I also got to do pro bono work in a number of ways. I mean, for example, I, in, in my last years at the firm, I represented a group of public housing tenants who uh, wanted to purchase their units, and we uh, ended up uh, striking an agreement with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the district's housing authority that they could uh, rely on their sweat equity, all of the work they had put into maintaining their homes over the years to meet their purchase price plus one dollar to to purchase these units and to and to form a cooperative association. And I think it, it's a project that I continue to look back on with pride, and I feel uh, proud that the firm allowed me to do that and, and many other um, similar projects. 
I was able to uh, go for six months to the neighborhood legal services program where I did a lot of work in landlord tenant court and I was on loan from a law firm. So for me, the large law firm route was a way to to get to the work that I really wanted to do. That's amazing. And I think some of our uh, younger demographic may not appreciate that, especially when you going back to you writing that initial brief that this was pre cell phone, you know, pre computer. So you didn't have a lot of the same aids that are available to us over the last, you know, couple of decades. So so true, <laughs> so true. Yes. And uh, you know, obviously, the next step in your story legal career was being appointed to the bench by then President George W. Bush in 2006. Judges are very much in the headlines these days, as I'm sure you aware of and see to the many high profile legal cases making the news. Had you aspired to one day become a judge, or was this something? that gave you pause as to whether this was the right move for you at the time? I, I have several answers to that question. I mean, I told you I, I've always had an affection for my native district of Columbia, so I wanted to do something that was of service to the District of Columbia. I can't say I always aspired to be a judge, although I did think that judges were special and important people. That's because so much of my extended family uh, worked as a domestic workers in the home of a judge. I used to hear about the judge they worked for. and They would say the judge did this and the judge did that. And I thought, well, that's a pretty cool thing to be a judge. But I didn't think about it seriously. But I'll tell you, when I, when I first thought about it seriously uh, was a day when one of the partners I was working for was pleased with something I had done, some written legal analysis. And he said to me, Phyllis, you should be a judge on the D.C. Court of Appeals. And my reaction was, me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. And, and I had that reaction because um, I had not done a clerkship for a judge. Um, I went to a fine law school, GW, but it was not at the time an elite law school. Um, I didn't have connections to people. I thought, I don't see a pathway to the judiciary for me, but thank you for the compliment. But it just stuck in the back of my mind. And um, what actually made me decide I wanted to become a judge was that I, uh, as, as pro bono work at Covington, um, I agreed to accept an appointment by the mayor to something called the Board of Appeals and Review. This was a volunteer board of lawyers in our city who would hear appeals in certain cases. This was before we had an office of administrative hearings. And so I would hear appeals from people who had been denied licenses, maybe security guard licenses or um, health care providers who had been denied certificates of need. And our little board would hear their cases and write decisions. It was so interesting and so much fun, and I saw what a difference it could make in people's lives, and I suddenly knew what I wanted to do when I grew up, <laughs> even though I was already well into my 50s at the time. Um, and so uh, a few years later, there was a vacancy advertised on the D.C. Court of Appeals, and I thought, you know what? I'm applying for it, and I uh, feel very fortunate that, that I got that, so... Um, and I think it was a really good decision because I've I've really enjoyed the work on the court. And I think it um, I, I'm able to bring my strengths to it. I, I don't ever think I would have been a great trial lawyer. Uh, I don't think I would have been a very good trial judge. But I think I'm pretty good at what I do as an appellate judge, which is to uh, analyze legal issues and and write opinions. And I I very much like the challenge of, of coming to understand the case, coming to appreciate the arguments of both sides, and trying to render a fair decision in accordance with the law. It's a very, it's a very satisfying job. Wow, that's amazing. And, and now that you've been sitting on the bench for a fairly lengthy amount of time, as well as being in the profession itself, obviously, looking back, what have you found to be the most rewarding experience um, or experiences being an attorney and judge? And also, what has been the most challenging? Are there any other cases you've been involved with that maybe have left a better impression on you over others? Um, well, 
I, I always say when people ask me what what case I feel the proudest of or the most satisfying one, I think I, I always give the same answer, which is um, that I wrote for our court the en banc opinion in a case called Jackson versus Board of Elections and Ethics. And it was a case about whether or not um, there could be on the ballot um, a referendum provision that would uh, ban same-sex marriage. The Council of the District of Columbia had passed legislation authorizing it, and some citizens in the district were opposed to that, and they wanted to essentially repeal that legislation. And I just thought this was so discriminatory and so unfair that I could not believe that the uh, Council of the District of Columbia, which had also uh, passed our Home Rule Act, could have intended that the um, uh, referendum process be used for that purpose. So um, I wrote the the decision for our court that um, kept that provision off of the ballot. So that's the one that I think is gave me the most satisfaction and has had some of the greatest impact. But I have to say that I feel that kind of satisfaction with with every case um, uh, because and it because we get you know we get a lot of cases that are of um, widespread importance, but then we get a lot of other cases that are important only to the people involved in them. You know, workers' compensation benefits cases where the issue is whether or not the injured worker uh, or the worker who has clay who claims to have been injured on the job and to be suffering the effects of that will will get benefits or not and. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that we always rule in favor of the claimant. We certainly don't. But I, I, I take some pride in in trying to give a fair hearing to to the issues and to write a decision in a way uh, that that well explains um, our our rationale. Um, so I I just take continuing satisfaction in that. Um, that the most difficult thing I guess is is reaching agreement. It's it's hard to be an appellate judge. We we sit in three judge panels uh, in order to decide a case the way you think it should be decided. You have to, to get on board at least one of those other <laughs> two judges, and sometimes it's very hard. We we bring different perspectives, and so, um, yeah, that's very difficult. The work is also very demanding. We have a, a huge caseload as uh, an urban court. This is true in all big cities, and so... Um, uh, we've had, you know, a little bit of relaxation in our schedule because so many cases, uh, uh, so many trials didn't happen during the pandemic. So we're not quite back at the full load that we had. But it it's a very demanding job for sure. I'm a senior judge now. And so my schedule is, is getting a little bit lighter. But it, it definitely is a commitment of time and, and energy. Uh, uh, someone once said to me that I had decided to... Uh, take it easy in my older years by moving from private law firm to the bench. And I just laughed and said, well, that just shows you have no idea what a workload is like. Right. That's that old saying, uh, new levels, new devils, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Isn't it? Okay, great. And um, as reflecting on your bio, giving back, as you've you know, spoken throughout our conversation, by volunteering your time is of very high importance to you. It is. Why is that? And how rewarding has it been to become involved in a variety of worthwhile not-for-profit endeavors, including, as you mentioned, the important work you do as a trustee of the National Conference of Bar Examiners? Uh, well, you know, I guess if I try to explain why it's important to me, I, I sort of hearken back to my first interest, which was to study religion and ethics. It, my concentration was in ethics when I was at Princeton and the course that I taught in the Department of Theology, uh, Theology at Georgetown was, was Christian ethics and modern life. I, I've always tried to figure out what we ought to be doing here on this earth, <laughs> why we're here. And my answer to that question is, um, we, we're here to love and serve each other. And, and so um, that makes sense of life to me, to do service. It, it doesn't it doesn't make much sense of life to be all about just gathering material things or or sort of getting through the day without accomplishing anything. So I want to try to give back and I want uh, to find other ways to do that um, that haven't yet occurred to me. So I, I think I've got a 
uh, a lot more possibilities in me now. I'm hoping to to serve in some different ways now that I am semi-retired. So I, I look forward to the possibilities. Um, I'd actually like to be more, uh, become more involved with Clio. So that's something I'll talk with you about. Hey, the door is always open. My phone is always available. So I'm up, we're going to hold it to that. You, you should have said that on tape. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said it publicly. So now <laughs> you can hold me to it. Absolutely. Look forward to having doing that, getting more involved. This, this one of these last parts of the episode is meant to be a quick fun break from some of the thought provoking questions we've asked to this point. And we call it rapid fire where I as the host will ask you a few random questions and you just have to try and answer as quickly and honestly as you can. So you ready? Here we'll go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's your favorite and least favorite food to eat? Movie? No, fa- favorite and least favorite food to eat. Oh, food to eat. I'm sorry. There was an echo there. I didn't hear my, oh, my favorite food to eat. You know, I love scrambled eggs and, um, and, and I eat them every day, even though my doctor says it's not a good idea. <laughs> I love potatoes. Of any potatoes. Kind. Yes. So bre- any you're a breakfast Mostly person. mashed potatoes. <laughs> yes. You're, you're a breakfast person. Okay. I'm a breakfast person. Yes. And a breakfast of scrambled eggs and fried potatoes is just best. Especially if you throw in some grits with them. <laughs> and where is one place you would love to visit anywhere in the world but haven't been able to do so yet? Um, I think I would like to go to Ghana uh, to the port of no return from which slave ships were launched. And I haven't been to the Far East, so I think I'd like to go to Japan. I have traveled through most of the United States and I've seen a good bit of Europe. I'd like to go to Antarctica. I, I'm fascinated. I would be fascinated to see a place with um, so few humans. Yeah, ironically, one of my cousins just came back from there. He said he had a fantastic time. That was, Is that right? that was the last of his seven continents to visit, so he wanted to uh, check out. Oh, yeah, I'd like to he do He got that. to play with penguins and everything. It was crazy, yeah. What's a uh, TV show you like to watch that your colleagues may be surprised to find out you're into? <laughs> I don't think anybody would be surprised. I am a law and order addict. I'll watch any form of law and order. I recently discovered that there was a season of Law and Order Los Angeles, which I think lasted only a season, but I like that too. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> sucker for a law show. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a cliche for you, Judge, because I mean, that yes. was fit. Oh, that should definitely fit. <laughs> Absolutely. Who's your, who's your favorite pro sports team, if you have one? Oh. Yeah, I'm not much of a sports person, but I'll, I, I am really interested in the Olympics. And I tell people that in my next life, I'm going to be a track star. So <laughs> I'm going to say that uh, I'll, I'll take Noah Lyles as uh, the track star is the one I like to watch. And I like to watch gymnastics a lot. Gotcha, gotcha. That sounds like my wife. She's a big, she and her, my mother-in-law, a very big Olympia fan. So I yes. understand that. And lastly, if given the opportunity, what's a new skill that you would like to learn and why? Oh, a new skill? I want to play the piano. I never took mm. piano lessons. I never took music lessons of any kind. And I, another thing I'm planning to do in, in the next life, if I were to have one, is, is to be a conductor. But I realize I'd have to learn to play an instrument. So my children tell me mama you could do this you could take lessons even now and i say yes but i don't want to play chopsticks i want to sit down and play a symphony so that's what i'd like to learn to do there was no time for music lessons because you were too busy getting out <laughs> in school <laughs> maybe that's the excuse <laughs> yeah well judge we would thank you again for participating in this episode and we would like to close with you taking a moment to answer these last two introspective questions if you had a time machine it could go back, what advice would you give to your younger self to maybe avoid some of the pitfalls you experienced along your journey to the heights of the profession? Um, I would tell my younger self not to be so um, needy about getting good grades uh, and to explore more subjects that I should have studied. I am uh, acutely aware that I needed to have taken more history classes, for example, more economics classes. I should have studied music. There's so many things 
I wish that I had a better handle on. And I think I could have done some of those things, but I was a little afraid, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought um, that my uh, background training wasn't good enough. And, you know, my high school wasn't strong in some of these subjects. You know, I really wanted to succeed. Um, and, and looking back on it now, I, I think fear is a terrible thing and you shouldn't let yourself be consumed. You, you should try everything and do your best and, and let the chips fall where they may. So that's what I would tell my younger self. Wow. I mean, it was awesome. good to get the good grades and they opened some doors, but I think doors could have opened uh, anyway. Wow, that's, that's, that's awesome. Secondly and lastly, what is your hope or vision for the future of the legal field and the ongoing pursuit of more diverse representation within it? Um, it it's definitely a time of change. I'm very interested in some of the efforts to take another look at uh, legal education and admissions to the bar. Does law school need to be a three-year program? It's so expensive. It's it's almost too expensive for people to afford to go out and do the work they want to do. Uh, jurisdictions have tried uh, licensing paraprofessionals, uh, but those people, I think the state of Washington had limited license legal technicians uh, who could go to shorter term educational programs and get out and do work to represent people. But it's difficult, it was difficult, I understand, for them to make a living and people still couldn't afford their services. Somehow we've got to bridge the gap uh, between the need for legal services and um, those who are available to help provide them. And the costly three-year legal education uh, is, is standing in the way of that, I think. So I think we need more experimentation. Um, uh, the ABA is, is open, more open to online law schools now. That's a possibility. Um, uh, so I think we, we have to be open to change. I, I believe uh, that we need a bar exam, but some people think there ought to be other pathways to licensure for lawyers, and perhaps that's a possibility. Um, uh, certainly, uh, p perhaps more of a possibility in smaller communities than in larger ones, but, but maybe we've got to put everything on the table and figure out um, how to make it more possible to bridge that gap. Wow, fantastic words of wisdom, and um... Judge, we thank you again for your t being so generous with your time. We wish you continued success in your career and all your other pursuits, including learning to play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you so much for for the Edge Award honor. It's, it, it really is a true honor, very humbling. It will cause me to redouble my efforts to work toward diversity in our profession. Yeah, we're very excited to have you and the three other your three fellow honorees join us on April the 11th. And um. You couldn't be more deserving, so we appreciate it. Thank you so much. We would like to again thank Judge Phyllis Thompson for joining us on today's episode of the Clear Edge Podcast. As a listener, we cordially invite you to come celebrate Judge Thompson and the other three distinguished individuals we'll be recognizing in our fifth annual Clear Edge Honors Reception and Awards Program, which will be taking place the evening of Thursday, April the 11th at Greenberg Trial at Skytown, D.C. offices. Earlier that same day, we will also be hosting our first annual Clio Legal Pipeline Career Expo at American University Washington College of Law from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. To register or to attend one or both of these events, please visit our ClioInc.org website and click on the appropriate link. Once more, I'm Leigh Allen II, Chief Operating Officer for Clio Inc. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Clio Edge Podcast.